Uh, so my name is Joe Deary, and I'm a faculty member at Keene State College. I teach in the Film Studies program, and I'm really excited to have Nomi Talisman here on stage with me, the co-creator of the film we just watched. Um, so I'm going to kick off the Q&A for us and ask a few questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And there should be two microphones that uh, are roving the audience, um, and you can raise your hand and someone will bring one to you and then you could ask your question into the mic. So I'll remind you of that uh, in a second. So my first question um, has to do with your treatment of the subject. So that we, we hear this story from Bill, the brother of Manny, um, and we hear the story of Manny's life and um, his conviction, uh, his arrest and conviction and um, death from capital punishment. Um, and I find it really fascinating and interesting that um, one of the storytelling choices you made um, was to keep the details of the crime uh, from us till the very end and to sort of focus, you know, I, I focus much more on Bill's experience of, of his brother's life um, and the tragedy of that and, and also his own disillusionment with the justice system and that, you know, just watching it again, the line where he says, I thought justice would prevail and it does not. It just, um, I think all, it's also very topical with what's been going on in our country in the Black Lives Matter movement. It's just really, um, it's tragic to hear him say that line. So I thought I'd ask you about that storytelling choice to kind of keep the details of the crime at the, at the end, yeah. Um, okay, so, so first of all, thank you, and I can barely see anyone, but I'm guessing there are people here. Um, and and um, thank you for um, having me here. Uh, when we started um, uh, just editing and putting the story together, one of the things um, that we did is uh, pretty much avoiding the crime. Um, the reason was, I mean, there, there were several reasons for that, but the main thing is like we really wanted to carry with the story from Bill's point of view, and obviously we couldn't not put it at all. So we went back and we just really thought about um, what happens to Bill, and basically nobody, nobody witnessed that crime. The only person who witnessed that crime is Manny, who had no recollection of that evening, and it, it was all reconstructed from... Um, basically from the crime scene, and some of it from, um, I think, what they imagined that, that happened. And we didn't want to interrupt that voice. We wanted to keep that voice of, of discovery and understanding that you know, this crime that happened in the same neighborhood, which was very disturbing to, um, I think, to everybody, um, all of a sudden Bill realizes that his brother is responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to keep that we wanted to keep his voice as authentic as, as we could in terms of the way that he was telling it and the way that he was discovering it and, and getting into that realization. And at one point in the interview, um, in the second round of it, he kind of stopped and explained what he thought he, what he thought would happen. And his tone just totally changed. And, and we felt like that this is not the experience that we want the film to be about. So we took all the, uh, we took all the details that some of them we called from Bill's interview and a lot of them just from, um, just from um, documents and legal documents and some of the journalists who worked on the case at that point and when it was happening, when, when the trial was happening and we just summarized it and put it at the end. And what we realized is that we, it put the film in context of exactly what you were mentioning uh, which is also unfortunately so current right now, even though the story itself is, um, the crime itself happened at the end of 1980. And even then it wasn't, you know, and obviously it wasn't a new story then, but um, we felt that the way that you carried with the voice of the teller and his discovery and his empathy to his brother that keeps, um, keeps the film going yeah. and only being presented with a, with a uh, sort of colder evidence at the end gives it a certain um, strength, I would say, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a, you know, you, it does reframe the story a bit, but his narration is so powerful that you're, you've already 
been on that emotional journey with him. Um, my other question, uh, because I teach animation over at Keene State College, was to just sort of um, get your insights into how you and your co-creator chose the rotoscope technique as your you know, uh, method of creating the film and how you collected your um, source imagery and just the process and, and maybe talk about what that process is for folks that might not be familiar with animation. Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, when we interviewed Bill, we already interviewed two other people uh, for, for, for this project. Then the first family we interviewed um, needed anonymity. And both of us, um, both Dee and I come from arts background and we never made a documentary before. Okay. I mean, we, we worked a little bit with video and, and somewhat with video and film and uh, we did a lot of drawings and, and it was kind of like, oh, that's kind of a no brainer. We should do it in animation. Little did we know that that's gonna probably slow down the process by you know three years or something. Um, so by the time we got to work with Bill, we already realized, even though we had just tiny, tiny bits of tests, we realize that we have a great tool to work with all these things that, especially in this story, are of the past in somebody's mind, um, a shift in perspective from Bill to Manny, from, from reality of what's happening in the, in, in the outside or what's happening in the world to what is happening in, in, in the mind of somebody who's mentally ill. So we knew that we had this, this tool that is super effective and, and, and that we felt very comfortable working with. Again, coming from arts background and uh, used to work with metaphors. Yeah. Um, so after we did the, the interview with him, which is done on tape, so, so uh, basically the interview was filmed with two cameras. One of them was static, the other one we moved around so we can take a um, uh, few more angles and mostly close-ups. Uh, we laid down just the audio. So we just um, uh, added, uh, edited the story as if it's a, as if it's a radio uh, story. Several people said that that could be on, on uh, This American Life, <laughs> and in some way, you know, in some ways, it probably comes out from from that edit. And the first thing that we did after that is we pulled every play. So we worked with a black screen and just the audio, and then we turned on the video just in the places which we wanted to see Bill's face. Um, and we felt like, okay, here he says something that's very powerful. Here has like a gesture that's really interesting. Um, here, okay, we haven't seen him for two minutes, you know, we, or three minutes, we might need to come back to him. So we pulled up just the, just the videos. And um, one of the things that we really wanted to honor is the time and the details of the story, but the time that he spent with us and, and the care. And we felt that the only way to put it back is to draw his face frame by frame just to be as, as accurate as we can. So from that little, um, from these little snippets where you see his face, we are actually exporting every single frame and, and drawing on top of it. We actually took it to one of the many granting agencies that uh, supported us. At one point, they, want, they wanted us to come and show a two minute clip and, and we showed that. And there was a woman who is a journalist who worked with them who came to us later and said, that's Bill, I know him. So it's like, if you know him, you, you can, you, you totally know that that's his face. It's it's totally accurate, and from there we basically cut the film into um, section. Pretty much storyboarded it um, more like uh, what's the time period, what's the what's the tenure that we want to keep, what's the what, what's the most important things, how do we want to uh, convey it in in um, in animation. Um, for example, we took all the all the uh, footage from Vietnam is government footage that was shot in in Quezon. And I wouldn't be surprised if Manny is actually in some of the some of the real footage. But we wanted to keep that uh, texture of 16 millimeter film. And the closest thing to it was to drop the computer to the side and actually draw it on charcoal on paper and scan it in. And in the scene where Manny is being arrested, he's playing with the kids and he's making these tents. And we shot the whole thing on, on video. Uh, it, it's actually, it's our kid playing there and we build the tents and but one of the things that really jumped kind of to, to our minds is he's playing tents and he was in the army and it's kind of close and, and, and the kids are kind of playing and he has PTSD, he can snap any minute. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to go back and draw it in a way that is is close to the archival footage. But to, to link those animation yes. techniques. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. So that's that's a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so I'd love to have a question from the audience. And if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and I believe someone will bring you a microphone. Anybody have a question for Nomi? There's somebody here in the front. Well, we have these wonderful microphones. Is it on? Hello. Um, how, where did this process begin? In other words, it, wh when did you decide to do the story about this whole subject? At what point? In other words, before you found Manny and all of that, what was that sort of, I want to do this kind of story about this issue? Um, or is that not where it started? No, 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 that's, that's yeah. totally. Um, I had a day job with a, a little nonprofit in San Francisco the, and with investigators who work on death penalty plea cases, and they needed somebody to come and do um, uh, video interviews of them and to manage all the media. Um, so uh, basically I would go with investigators and talk to people like Bill, it could be family members, could be teachers, could be community members of people who are um, uh, facing uh, um, uh, I, usually it's in a pre-trial, so, so it's before they're being, um, usually in, in very early stages, so before it's, it's um, necessarily going to be a, a capital case, but most likely um, sometimes in later appeals. Um, so the investigator would go and you know, knock on the door and talk to somebody who, let's say, he has a brother on death row, or a woman who has a son who might be um, facing a, a death sentence. And I would just sit there and, and record the interview. And their speciality, the, that agency, um, their speciality was, is, they're still working, um, mostly mental illness uh, and some other mitigating um, circumstances. And Every once in a while, I would go back home and I would talk to Dee, who's my partner and also the, the collaborator on the film. I was like, you know, this is, these are kind of amazing stories and it sounds like this is a voice that's really missing in the current conversation about criminal justice. So eventually we went back to the agency and we said, and we kind of said, it's like, hey, we want to do something with that with your permission if you connect us to people. And at the time we thought it's going to be maybe a five minute film and, and probably an installation and maybe audio recording. And they were thrilled uh, and they confirmed what we were thinking that it's this voice is just totally missing from this conversation and, and it needs to be out there. And they started connecting us to people and eventually after I think the first or second people or families that we interviewed, we realized it really needs to be a film. Uh, there's no reason to cut the stories again into something short that doesn't really tell the story. But the interviews that we had with, were with people who told interesting stories, but they were not great storytellers. So we went back to them and said, okay, do you have a great storyteller? And they, and they sent us to Bill. So it's kind of like an elongated um, answer. And, and at first we thought we might have enough material for a feature and, and couldn't, and, sort of weave the stories together. And I think that especially with the animation, it was just incredibly confusing. And we decided to take the best story of them and just see how long it is. And it ended up being 32 minutes. Is there another question? Yeah. Yes, there's another. So how did you or, or did you make a decision for the viewer not to know, not to be sure what race the, um, the, the family was? What? Okay. Oh, I felt like when we were watching it, we couldn't tell what race, you know, what color the person's skin was completely in there. Right. And did you do that purposefully or, or was it, did you think it was obvious to people anyway? Um. I mean, it's, it, it, it was a deliberate choice, and the reason is but that we want people to actually think about it. And I think that it's, it's in Bill's case, it's pretty, um, it's pretty readable. And at the same time, you have to think about what are the things that you read in it. So, so as I, do you read, his, do you read his, his features? Do you read his voice? Do you read the way that he, the, the way that he talks? Are you waiting to, until the, the way that he says, you know, basically he repeats the racial slurs? by the lawyers and then you're convinced. And, and we wanted to keep that tension because we felt that, um, 
instead of enjoying him in, and also, and also keep in mind this animation, the last thing that we wanted to do is repeat something that, you know, somebody would turn around and said, well, you just made a racial cartoon. Um, so we thought, okay, th there's a tension here between what you can read and what you know and, and what you think you read into, into a character that we were very interested in. And lastly, in terms of drawings, we wanted to, to keep it as simple as possible. And I think that at pretty much the beginning of all drawing is, is pencil, pen on paper. So it's, it's kind of like, it's the most immediate, very, um, I mean, it's, very, it's, it's thought out. Obviously, we, we designed it, but, um, but just a very immediate, very um, direct drawing of just a line on, on a screen, but on, on a paper. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Um, it's always been my understanding that, that one of the problems with the death penalty is that it costs so much because it takes so much time after, um, after the penalty has been, you know, addressed that so many people get in, into it. And how much time was it after that he was uh, given the death penalty that he was actually executed? Um, Manny, it, well, it was nearly 20 years after he committed the crime, and he was, um, and it was another two years, it's about 17 years or so. California is, is, specific, is, is particularly slow. Some, some states are faster. The federal government sometimes moves in faster, but California is, is particularly slow. So how many, how many years was it? I, 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 I think roughly 17. 17 years? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. And, and one of the things that I want to add in relation to that is these are not just 17 years that he sits on death row. These are 17 years that the family and the victim's family are being dragged back and forth to jail, to, to court. They go into repeated um, appeals and, and, and other procedures. And um, we have a bunch of advisors who worked with us on, on, on this project. And one of the things that um, they said that mostly for the victims' families, there's no, it, it doesn't resolve anything. It's not a resolution, it's not, it, and it's not something that actually they feel better after that, partially because they've been back and forth in court and they have to relive this trauma sometimes, you know, I don't know, for, yes. for something like 17 years. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. There was another one. Yeah. Yeah, just. Um, just to bring it back to animation style, um, I was just wondering if you could talk about the significance of the animation style of Bill changing so drastically at the end. Um, I just, like the clarity and color seemed pretty significant as like changing factors throughout the film and that moment stood out to me the most. And I was wondering if you just expand on that a little bit. Right, so, so there's the several different things that we, um that we had going in a film. Um, we tried to use color just throughout the film as sort of to punctuate some, some, some elements. So at the beginning, it's, it's very muted kind of um, um, subdued blues and, and, and um, browns, which felt more like, you know, faded family photos or, or faded um, uh, home movies from, from, you know, 50s and 60s. Um, then comes the explosions. Um, which is this drive in rain, and we really wanted to use the color as, um, and, and the imagery, um, the imagery in total in, in this whole scene, but also the color is to kind of have the windshield wiper move from one reality to another. So it's like it's rained and it's an explosion. It's it's just a straight in rain on you know around Christmas time, and you see all the red lights. To it's like an it's it's very stark, and it looks like sort of. Um, some drawing of, of bombs or explosions. And we wanted to use that in places where it kind of like it comes in and it throws you somewhere else and you understand that what you see is, is, is more than just one clear reality of what you think is out there. And in terms of Bill, um, we really thought really hard about the, the metaphor of what kind of a person he is. 
uh, where is he in life? I mean, he was telling us this whole story so many years after, after the crime, so many years after Manny was executed, and he's not getting off this drive to San Quentin that, that kind of repeats several times in, in the film, and he's so articulate, and he's so together, and he just tells you the story, and he's there, and he breaks down and he cries. And he's all the time he's like that. So his line is like, it's very kind of clean and holds together, but it's always a little bit broken. And we thought at the end, um, to do these close up in a really in a different way that kind of shows all these, um, sort of the softness and also all the, um, all the other bits of him that don't quite sit together. And it's almost like you, 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 you're so close to him so you can see a little bit of, um, of um, texture. And at the same time, you know, you look at his, um, his beard, you know, when he moves his hand and you can hear the noise of it. So we wanted to add this texture at the end. It's almost like after you heard him tell the whole story and he's a little bit removed, you come really close at the end and you're just with, with him in that experience. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay? No? One more question? We have time for one more, if there's one more question. Well, this was really wonderful, and I, I can't imagine this story being told more effectively in any other form. It, it just was so impactful, and I, I'm just very impressed with how you were able to do that. I do have a question. Um, you know, I think an important highlight is uh, the mental illness. And um, at one point it is said that he had paranoid schizophrenia. And then he was um, dealing with a post-traumatic uh, stress. But did he ever receive any um, um, help for his mental illness? Was he ever given medication or counseling or any? Did he have a case manager working with him in any way? Or was he pretty much sent off to jail and had to deal with, with his um, mental illness by himself. Do you know? Um, I, yes, I kind of I have um, several um, answers to that. Uh, first of all, when he was, um, at the beginning of the story, Bill describes when Manny was, was 12 year old, years old and he was hit by a car and obviously that was already a traumatic head injury. Um, so he basically fell through the cracks throughout his life. Um, you know, he, he was drafted where there's no question that they shouldn't be uh, in the military. When he came back, the diagnosis at the time of paranoid schizophrenia was, um, we're talking about the DSM, the, um, the definition of uh, paranoid schizophrenia at the time was actually an umbrella, um, an umbrella term to a lot of, to a huge range of things, including PTSD. So actually his diagnosis of PTSD never came, um, he, he was never fully diagnosed with PTSD. The way that he was diagnosed then with paranoid schizophrenia probably answered that. And because he very quickly found himself on the streets, he was never really um, treated for anything. Uh, once he was in prison, I think, once he was in San Quentin, I think it was some kind of, of support that he got. And, and also he was in a safer environment. Um, and I mean, to me, actually, the probably the most uh, disturbing, I don't know if the most disturbing, but a very disturbing aspect of that, this thing is happening right now with returning veterans. This is not an incident from, from Vietnam. It keeps happening. There are a lot of veterans that find themselves on the street. Third of, of one in th third of, of uh, people on death row are veterans. So it's like three in 10 are veterans. Um, and there are a lot of stories about, about um, veterans who are not getting treatment to who you know, find themselves now with exactly the same you know, very similar situations. Um, homeless, they're not treated, they're not, they don't get the medical help that they, that they need. Um, I would say that this, this film, we did a screening two days ago and somebody said, oh, more than it's an anti-death penalty film, it's an anti-war film. And to me, the three things that are probably uh, the most prominent in the film that I would get is that kind of, I would weave together is mental in illness, um, lack of care to vet, you know for veterans and the, and racism 
And I think that all these three things played a huge role in, in Manny ending up where he ended up. Yeah, well, I think you handled it very effectively. It was great. Thank you. So we'll wrap up. Thank you, Nomi, for creating a really powerful film and sharing it with us. And thanks for coming to New Hampshire. And there's another screening at 8 p.m. So stick around. Thanks, everyone.